Uh, I'm going to introduce our second speaker today, uh, Michael Horowitz. He's an associate professor of political science at the University of Pennsylvania, and he's also a senior fellow of the Foreign Policy Research Institute. Uh, today he's going to be talking to us about technological innovation and the American way of war. Mike is very well suited for this task. Uh, he did a PhD at Harvard University, uh, where his dissertation uh, dealt with uh, diffusion of military power, causes and consequences of international politics, which was turned into a book that came out from the University of Princeton, or Princeton University, uh, and won several awards. Mike is an expert on all sorts of international security issues, particularly in the realm of technology. In the past, he has done consulting work for Andrew Marshall's uh, Office of Net Assessment that uh, Ron spoke about before. He is just back from a year in the Pentagon. He was a Council on Foreign Relations International Affairs Fellow in the Force Development Office in the Undersecretary of Defense uh, for Policies Office. And uh, he has a long, and, uh, a long series of publications and has been at Penn since uh, 2007. Uh, without further ado, Mike. Thanks, Mike. Uh, thanks so much for being here today to listen to me. Thanks to, to FPRI for inviting me and the First Division Museum. It's really an honor to, to be here, and I'm looking forward to getting a chance to see the museum uh, actually later uh, today. So the, the title of my uh, talk, as Mike said, I'm a bit of a wanderer, uh, is Technological Innovation in the American Way of War. And what I want to focus on essentially is the intersection of technology and people, how that's worked since essentially the Gulf War and what that means for the United States moving forward. So on the screen right now are a series of military technologies that have come to embody what the American way of warfare has looked like over the last uh, few decades. In the top left, for example, that's a, that's a Reaper, one of the drones that we've used in Afghanistan and Iraq, and allegedly in other places. We have a, a sort of B-2 bomber here. Uh, this is a shot of the uh, armies uh, still being developed, a new uh, joint uh, light uh, tactical vehicle. Up here is a shot from the first Gulf War of the USS Missouri firing a Tomahawk uh, missile, with the Tomahawk being a, a great, and its guidance system being a great example of some of the, the precision munitions that Ron was talking about in, in his lecture. We have an unmanned army vehicle here that was later canceled, but the army actually just a few weeks ago announced that they might try to reduce the size of, their, of the brigade combat team, the sort of basic unit of uh, force in the army, by 25%, uh, replacing essentially a lot of back office people and logistics with, uh, with, with robots. And down here, of course, we have America's most advanced uh, robotic weapon. Uh, I guess it's not a weapon yet, the, uh, the X-47B a drone that took off and landed itself on an aircraft carrier uh, last summer on the George H.W. Bush. So why am I telling you about uh, all of these things? So if you remember nothing else, try to remember the following three things. First, the United States has been at the cutting edge of military innovation for, for decades. It is, it is not an understatement to say that we are the best in the world. And as an American, that makes me very happy, and I hope that it stays that way. And this is important because if you think about what makes the American military the best in the world, you can think about it broken down very, 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 very simply into a product of, of two things. Essentially, the, the stuff that we have and how we use it. And, and today, I'm primarily going to be talking about the stuff that we have. I'm primarily going to be talking about uh, our leadership in military innovation, the, some of the technologies that the United States has used to great effect uh, over the last few decades, and then where I think things are headed. But that only turns into the best military in the world when you add the best troops in the world and the best training in the world, which is what the United States has and what we're extremely fortunate to have. So do not take my focus on, on I'm going to talk about lots of gadgets here. Do not take my discussion of gadgets to mean that I, I'm you know, not aware of the, the sort of human component here. It's that interaction that makes the American military the best in the world. And then the last third of my talk, I'm going to introduce a couple of things that actually make me a little bit nervous. Uh, a new generation of military technologies that are, have already come online and are starting to come online 
that could potentially place U.S. military superiority over the, over the medium term at risk if the United States is not a sufficient, does not invest sufficiently in this new generation of technologies, something made all the more complicated and difficult by the, the sort of federal budget crisis as a whole alluded to in the last uh, discussion. All right, so to start, uh, here's sort of an overview of the four big sections that I'll do. I'll talk about first kind of what is innovation, thinking about military innovation and how military innovation spread. I'll talk about why this is something that's been particularly important to the American military over the last few decades. I'll talk about some specific innovations, things like stealth and GPS, and how they've been relevant to the way that the United States has fought. And then I'll talk about sort of what's next uh, in the future. All right, to start with this question of what is uh, innovation. I think it's important to distinguish between two things, invention and innovation, because we often confuse them. Invention, you can think about as creating something. Invention is sort of creating something. This is the uh, NeoNode N1, one of the first touchscreen phones ever invented. And the first, actually, to have that, that, that thing where you have an iPhone when you, when you move your finger across the screen and it unlocks it, that was actually invented by, uh, that was actually debuted in this phone. That's an invention. This is an innovation. The iPhone was an innovation because it took a bunch, of a bunch of individual technological developments that had been going on in the, in the smartphone space over the, over the preceding couple of years and put them together in a beautiful design package that made millions and millions of people go buy it and still continue to buy it. So I think that's distinct, this distinction is important. And what I'm going to try to do when I talk about some of these technologies is talk about this difference, because I think that difference is important for understanding what makes the American military so good at using all of these technologies. Now, if you think about this in the military sense, you know, take an example from military history, think about the difference between the invention of the tank, it's a British Mark I tank, I think there might have, actually, I think there was a Mark tank outside, or it might have been an American World War I tank. Uh, from, from World War I, the British, you know, invent the tank, they, they kind of figure out a little bit how to use it, but they're not the ones we think about as the great innovators when it comes to tank warfare. Instead, we think about the Germans in, in Blitzkrieg. And this is a shot of, the, of a German tank rolling through France in 1940. And it's this distinction, the difference between inventing a technology and then figuring out how to leverage that technology for whatever purpose you want, whether it's military or not, that I think is really important here and what constitutes a military innovation. But then just as important is understanding how these things spread. Because we'd like to think sometimes, and, and as Americans, we've been very lucky to debut lots of new military technologies, and in some cases seem to have a monopoly over a couple of them. But that's far from the norm, obviously, because there's a natural tendency when technology is invented for, for it to spread. On the left side here, we have uh, sort of the total adopters. You can think about this as the number of actors that have uh, adopted an innovation at a given point. And on the bottom here, we have the, the time since the, the first, first sort of country or first uh, company debuted something. And this is called a cumulative adopter function. And when innovations spread, they tend to follow what's called an S-curve, in that you have this, this sort of nascent period followed by a takeoff where lots of people uh, adopt, uh, you know, adopt, adopt innovations or you know, buy new technologies. And then you have sort of this slowdown point where something reaches saturation. And this is something, this, this S-curve is basically true for lots of consumer sort of products that, we all, uh, that we've all sort of used or you know, certainly uh, thought about using. But it's also true for, for military technology and military innovations uh, as well. And this is really the key time period when we think about the way that the invention of new military technologies and, and the debut of, the, of then the subsequent innovations, uh, the way that they shape warfare, because it's in this period where something's been debuted and a couple people know what it's really gonna mean, but the, everybody else hasn't caught on yet. That's the period where it's, it's crucial to stay ahead. And keep that in mind, I'm gonna come back to this later to talk about why I think we're basically at this period with a bunch of new military technologies and why I think it's important, therefore, for the United States to continue uh, investing. But in general, we know that different kinds of military technologies, again, you know, thinking conceptual, conceptually about innovation, uh, spread uh, very differently. You know, some spread very slowly and some spread uh, more quickly. And nuclear weapons are an example of a military technology that's actually spread very slowly. 
in contrast to John F. Kennedy's prediction that you know, dozens of countries essentially would acquire nuclear weapons, you know, in a speech he gave in the early 1960s. See, not that many in the grand scheme of things have, have acquired nuclear weapons, even though obviously we still worry a lot about proliferation. I mean, and nuclear weapons are also somewhat unique in that, uh, for, for two reasons. One is that you, even a country like North Korea, if you put your nickels in a jar every year for 40 years, can eventually sort of build a nuclear weapon. And then second, nuclear weapons are the only military technology, at least that I can think of in, in, in Q&A, if someone can mention another one, that would be actually great. The only military technology where having the oldest, most busted version of that technology is still really relevant for international politics. The oldest and most busted version still gets North Korea in the front page of the New York Times. It still changes the way that the United States thinks about how, how it interacts with North Korea. There's not really another equivalent military technology, an old aircraft carrier, an old fighter plane, you know, an old gun. None of those are you know, the way that sort of nuclear weapons are. So, so nuclear weapons spread very slowly. You can think about fighter aircraft in the middle, and that everybody knows how to basically build airplanes, and everybody has some kinds of fighters, but more advanced fighters are something that, that generally are debuted by a few countries, and then eventually saturate throughout the, the international system along that kind of you know, S-curve uh, way that, we were, you know, that, I was, that I was talking about before. Third one, that's, a, that's an AK-47. For, for better or worse, I think probably for worse, you can walk through basically any city in the world, including many American cities, and basically trip on an AK-47. And, and that are, you know, thanks to our Russian friends who have you know, been back in the news uh, lately for their you know, wonderful behavior, the, uh, you know, the AK-47 is, is in some ways the most ubiquitous gun in the, in the world, and it's sort of spread all around. Now, what, 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 de what determines whether these things spread quickly or, or more slowly? Well, one thing is basically, one, I guess two key factors that I want to mention. The first is, is the underlying basis of the technology militarily oriented or commercially oriented? Because things that are militarily oriented are, are things that can be more difficult to build. You can, you can sort of shield that technology Often, you know, if you can keep secrets, then you can maybe prevent somebody else from figuring out uh, how to do it. Whereas technologies with an underlying commercial incentive, underlying commercial basis to them, companies are going to spread around the world regardless. There's not a lot you're going to be able to do to control those kinds of technologies. So that's one thing. Second thing is to do with the unit cost. When the unit cost is really, really expensive, say, building a nuclear weapon, I mean, North Korea had to put a lot of nickels in the jar for 40 years to end up with a nuclear weapon. That's very different than buying something like an AK-47, even though a gun obviously is, is a, doesn't have a, I guess, a, you know, a purely like a non-military or non, I guess, non-hunting uh, uh, application. All right, so different kinds of military innovation spread uh, quickly, and the United States has been really fortunate to be at the front end of the, of the, of the technology diffusion curve for the last generation. So why has this been so important for the United States? Why is technological innovation important for the United States? This goes back in some ways to what Ron was, was talking about in, the, in, his, uh, in his lecture, but I think I, I'd actually chunk it into basically three categories, three reasons why the United States is focused a lot on uh, military innovation and military technology. And I'll go through each, I'll introduce each of these here and then go through them each in turn. The first is economic. I think there are, there are economic incentives for the United States to invest heavily in military technology per se. Second is political. I think there are political incentives uh, having to do with casualties that incentivize the United States to focus on military, uh, developing military technologies, essentially as a substitute for, for people. And then the third is purely military. The belief that the development of these sorts of technologies, the technologies that I'm going to talk about, make the United States significantly more likely to actually uh, win wars. So the first one, economic. What do I mean? And we, we talked in the Q&A period in the last discussion about the end of the all-volunteer army. I mean, sorry, the end of the conscription military and the shift toward the all-volunteer military. One of the things that did was change the relationship between capital and labor in the United States military. When you had a conscription military, labor was cheap. Soldiers were expendable. You could just conscript more of them. But when you have an all-volunteer military, labor becomes more expensive. You actually have to attract people into the military, which means you have to, and there are a whole litany of economic papers about this with lots of equations, if anybody wants to really get into it. 
um, you know, that you have to actually pay higher wages to those soldiers. Those soldiers become more expensive. Because those soldiers become more expensive, you then, inve you then in invest more per soldier in them. Those soldiers become more valuable, which shifts you towards capital, towards investing in technology. So one of the consequences of the shift from a conscription to a volunteer military in some ways is a greater emphasis in technology. There's also a comparative advantage for a country like the United States. We have the biggest, most technologically advanced economy in the world. Taking advantage of that for our military then is something that naturally uh, follows. And the third has to do with sunk costs. The platforms that have, that have generated America's military technological superiority over the last generation are extremely capital intensive. They're things like carriers and bombers and fighters. There are enormous sunk costs involved in creating those kinds of programs and investing in them. So once we had the lead in those kinds of technologies, it was to our benefit essentially to double down because we'd already paid the startup cost associated with uh, investing in those technologies. All right, so that's the economic incentive, I think for, for the, a focus on uh, technological superiority for the United States. Second one, uh, political. The political cost, the political issue I think here is mostly about casualties. And that casualties in warfare are extremely uh, draining for the, for the country, for, for people. Obviously, they're, they're tragedies. Uh, all of them, essentially, are, are, are tragedies and horrible for uh, sort of families and, and communities in the United States. They represent major political problems for presidents, for members of administrations, even for members of Congress. And so investing in potential military solutions that decrease the probability, or that you think will decrease the probability, that there'll be casualties, naturally attractive if you're an American decision maker. You know, very attractive. And so I think this is, this is, this is important, and I'm, I'm, I'm basically repeating myself here just to you know, keep this up a second, because I think this is actually a, a, a critical for understanding some of our focus on, on technology. Also think about the political implications of the economic costs of warfare. This is, a, this is not to say I agree with this, this is um, a, a Democratic uh, Senate um, slide, based, like PowerPoint slide, from 2008, you know, contrasting the cost of fighting in Iraq versus the you know, you know, money for, for Head Start programs, you know, a classic guns versus butter kind of distinction. And this is an example of you know, when you have a war that ends up going on for, for a long period of time and lots of people are dying and, it gener and you have those political costs generated by casualties, it leads more and more attention paid to these conflicts, which generates political costs for administrations. And so if you think that technology can help you get out of this trap, even though obviously it didn't in the case of Iraq, you have an incentive to invest in it. Third reason I think is purely military. And, and this in some ways is I think the most important driver for America's focus on military technological superiority. And in this category, I think that there are a couple of explanations as well. The, the first, again though, is lower casualties. From a military perspective, forget about the politics, forget about, forget about what public opinion polls will say. No chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff wants to lose more soldiers. If there's a way for, your un for a unit to come back with all of the people intact, that's obviously preferable, even from a military perspective. So again, an incentive for focusing on technology. The second is a perception that it can lead to shorter wars. That through things like the shock and awe campaign in 2003, at the beginning, at the kickoff to the conventional portion of the conflict with Iraq, through essentially demonstrating overwhelming conventional superiority, you can leverage military technology to knock people out of wars at the start, leading to wars of shorter duration and thus you know, lowering casualties and increasing then your probability of a victory. Third reason has to do with deterrence. The idea that when you build up a fearsome set of military technologies that nobody in the world wants to face, what you do is make war less likely. You make countries less likely to challenge you. And in some ways, America has been the victim of its own success in this regard. The demonstration of American might in fighting tank battles, for example, in the first Gulf War, was so overwhelming that, the rest, that many countries in the rest of the world decided, hey, we don't really want to do that anymore. 
The United States has used, essentially, its investments in military technology to discourage lots of other countries from investing in higher-end military technologies and to fight the United States, essentially, force on force, driving many of them instead towards more insurgent-ish solutions, which the United States was not quite as ready for and where America's technology was not quite as helpful. You know, a natural response by potential adversaries. But it doesn't mean that, that the, our technology didn't work. In some ways, our technology then works too well in those cases. Our technology is so good, it convinces other people not to compete in certain areas anymore, with the aircraft carriers actually being a really good example uh, of that, uh, the, the recent Chinese investment in essentially what's an old and busted carrier, uh, not, uh, notwithstanding. All right, so what are some examples of American innovations in warfare that have you know, shaped how things have gone over the last generation? I want to talk about uh, three or four here from the Persian Gulf War uh, up, to, uh, up to the present. The, the first, of course, and you know, one of the most, the most famous is uh, stealth. In the background here, we have an F-117 uh, Nighthawk, which flew, uh, I think, um, about 3,000 sorties during its, uh, during its lifespan, dropping about 2,000 uh, pounds, 2,000 tons, sorry, of munitions, which were about 80% or so uh, accurate. I think more on the, more on the accuracy part uh, sort of in a bit. And you know, stealth comes out of a, you know, a series of investments that were made in the you know, beginning, in, I mean, in some ways the 1960s, and especially then in the 1970s, uh, to try to decrease the radar cross-section of American airplanes. Uh, how, many of you, uh, how many of you watch The Americans, the, uh, the television show? Um, I, I, won't, I won't go into detail about this, because I don't want to spoil it if you're not caught up. But there's actually a great, uh, in I think two weeks ago, there was a fantastic description of how stealth works by a Vlad, one of the, the Soviet characters in the show. And he essentially talked about it as, you know, if you think about this as a radar cross-section of an airplane, stealth means going like that, which means the radar has a lot less to see. And so then I was like, oh, wow, that's a really great example. I hope I have a chance to use that at some point. But it's, I think it's a great example. If you think about if, if, if you know, this is what you were looking at before, and now you're looking at that, it's just much harder to see. And the United States uh, pioneered this, uh, this technology and then first debuted it uh, militarily in Operation Just Cause in Panama. It was the first use of the, uh, the F-117 of actually a you know, stealth uh, technology in an actual, you know, in, in a U.S. Uh, military operation. And since then, of course, we've, we've developed you know, several different stealth platforms, including the B-2, the most modern bomber that the United States has, uh, we have, we've developed a lower observability aircraft, like the F-22, and then the, if, you know, whenever it comes online, uh, F-35. We, there are allegedly, there is allegedly a stealth surveillance drone called the RQ-170, and there have been media reports, actually, that the United States is developing another surveillance drone called the RQ-180, which will have some sort of stealth uh, technology uh, in it. And stealth for surveillance obviously can be very helpful, since if you you know how how did we how did we think about evading uh, enemy air defenses during during the Cold War? Well, you could do it with you know the U-2 flew really high, but it turned out the U-2 wasn't invulnerable. So then we invent the SR-71, which flies so high and so fast that just nothing's going to be able to catch up to it anyway. So that's a great that's a great potential solution. Stealth is another way to do this. If if your adversaries can't see you, then you can hover above them and gather the intelligence that you need to gather without you know, something like the SR-71, which it turned out was enormously expensive to maintain, even though the coolest looking airplane ever. <laughs> but stealth, of course, has limitations. It's not, like, it's not, it's not magic. You know, low observability, I use that phrase low observability deliberately, because low observability doesn't mean zero observability. And it turns out that the United States, and especially America's adversaries, if you think about what countries like Russia and China are doing, are working on ways to detect you know, so-called stealth airplanes. The United States has been very fortunate, and I'll get back to this when I talk about drones, over the last decade, to, that in, in, from an air power perspective, the, the adversaries that the United States have fought have not been adversaries with, say, advanced radars and air defenses. How our current generation of stealth technology, how stealthy it would be, 
in a conflict against a more advanced adversary is something that we're, we're actually not, it, it would be unclear. I, I, I think our technology is fantastic. I presume it would be, would be great. But in some ways, this is, in, this is an open uh, question. And that the uh, shorter way to say this is, the best technology, the best tests or demonstrations of stealth have, have all been against lower end adversaries. And it would only be against a higher end adversary that you would know exactly how much you know, stealth you're, you're really getting. And then of course there's you know, next generation systems we're developing. This is the, the Zumalt uh, destroyer, the former um, uh, the DDX, uh, so expensive that we're only gonna build three of them. And uh, of course the, the F-35, uh, which is also expensive, but we're going to buy, you know, still buy 2,000 of them. But so stealth is, well, has, you know, been a critical advantage for the United States military, and it's something we are continuing to invest in in uh, future platforms. Next innovation I want to talk about is, is GPS, which, of course, you know, if, you know, for basically everybody that has a smartphone here, going back to the earlier example, they, they sort of, you now basically have uh, in your phone. So the first GPS satellites were launched in uh, 1978, and the, constellate, the GPS constellation was actually completed in April, uh, to, I think April, to that, uh, April 1995. And in between, as that constellation was going up, the United States obviously fought uh, conflicts, and what you saw then in, in things like the Persian Gulf War was the use of sort of Navstar and partial GPS to compensate for the fact that the whole architecture wasn't uh, up there. And when I talk about precision guidance in a second, uh, you'll get a sense of, of what having the full architecture up there has meant in terms of our usage of these uh, of this from a weapons perspective. But it's important to understand that just like we all have GPS in our phones and it's really useful, for example, GPS helped you know, get, uh, get me uh, here today. It's not just about bombs dropping on targets in a really accurate sense. It's also about uh, soldiers being able to figure out where they are if they're in the woods or in a city, or say when you know, I was lost in uh, China a couple of years ago, and it turned out that Google Maps worked just as well in Beijing as it, worked in, uh, it works in Philadelphia. It also works for, for you know, obviously there's, there's a variant that works for naval ships, and then of course it works for things like tanks. Think about the challenges that, that the, the Schlieffen plan in World War I, or the Blitzkrieg attack through the Ardennes faced, in World War II and just coordinating different movements, different, uh, different sort of tank units knowing where they are and where other people are. GPS has made all of that significantly easier. And so when you think about what GPS has meant for the American military, it's not just that it enables us to strike targets really precisely, it's also that it helps us navigate around the world very precisely. And that advantage is enormous. And to the extent that the United States has had or had something of a monopoly on this technology for a while, it yielded then significant, significant benefits. But strike, the United States can strike things very precisely, basically much more precisely than, than everybody else. As we know, after the early experiments, the first demonstration of precision guidance by the United States, you know, we believe, you know, was reported, was an Operation Linebacker in Vietnam. The total number of precision guided munitions used in the Vietnam War comprised about 1% of the, of the bombs uh, dropped and missiles fired uh, during the Vietnam War. And precision guidance has enabled a significant increase, significant increase in the accuracy of American weapons. Gone from uh, a period in World War II where you would have needed, you know, you needed a, a whole set of, you know, B of B, whatever the point in World War II you, know, you happen to be at, of say like B-29s, to uh, bomb a particular target, whereas now you might just need a Tomahawk missile. And there are multiple forms then when we think about precision guidance. We think about it as GPS, but it's not just GPS. For example, some of the early videos that we saw in the, if any, anybody remembers uh, watching, I mean, I was 12 years old and a huge dork, so I had CNN on during the first Gulf War, you know, watching, you know, American missiles, like, go through, like, the second story right window uh, of, uh, you, know, of, you know, like, some ministry in Iraq. And, you know, seeing that, you know, those, often those were laser-guided, it turned out, by U.S. Uh, special forces who had been on the ground. And there are other kinds of precision guidance as well. There's a radar homing, where a missile can detect a radar signal, you know, home, hone in on it, and attack. You have what uh, Tomahawk missiles have, 
which is essentially computer adapted guidance, where you're programming in to the computer on the missile what the landscape looks like. And as it, get as it gets close then, it accesses that library, essentially its own, basically like an offline Google Maps to figure out where to go. And of course you have GPS guidance as well. And the United States military has become increasingly dependent on these munitions. But it has not been without shortfalls. And, and nothing demonstrates this better, I think, than Operation Allied Force in Kosovo uh, for two reasons. The first was that GPS-guided weapons are only as good as the GPS. And in 1999, when it turned out that what we thought was a Serbian target was actually the Chinese embassy, eh, you know, you break a few eggs. The, sorry. Uh, more generally, though, the, what Operation Allied Force demonstrated was that there were, there were some pretty simple means that adversaries could use to frustrate even precision-guided munitions. The, the Serbs proved extremely effective at using basically simple covering concealment to hide their military equipment and to create uh, dummy, essentially, versions of their military, like faux versions of their military equipment. So we would see something, launch an extremely expensive GPS guided munition to blow it up, and then discover, in fact, that was not a Serbian tank afterwards. So it led to a lot of concern about what are the limitations of these kinds of weapons. And so the United States then attempted to to make them even more accurate, even more uh, devastating. And then the United States has then come to rely on them a lot more over time. From that 1% in the Vietnam War, that went up to about 7% then in Operation Desert Storm. And I mean, you guys can read. And then in the wars, in, in the conventional part of the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, what you see is that the, in terms of bombs dropped and missiles fired, well over 60%, creeping up to 70%, of US munitions used have featured precision guidance. All right, what about something even more contemporary? Think about unmanned aerial vehicles here, or, or what you know, are called in the media drones. So this is uh, a Reaper, the most advanced armed uh, drone that the, United States, uh, currently, uh, that the United States currently uses. Actually, keep, keep in mind this, um, this picture for, uh, we're, we're gonna come back to that picture later. So how has the United States uh, used these uh, over time? About 90%, or I think, I think a little over 90% of American operations, according to, to media, rep media reports, with, uh, with drones, with UAVs, are actually for surveillance. They have nothing to do with actually sort of launching weapons at uh, terrorists. But of course, that's the thing that, that we know about and pay attention to. We pay attention to because it's sort of trendy, and we pay attention to it because it leads to lots of protests. And you know, UAVs or, or drones firing uh, precision-guided munitions, firing Hellfire missiles, have proven to be an extremely powerful and effective pound-for-pound -pound weapon in the global war on terrorism. In that, if you consider the case of an operation where your alternatives are send in a team of people on the ground, fly a manned fighter, or use a UAV, the UAV can do things like hover over a building, wait until everybody's out of the building except for the one person you want to kill, and sort of la and launch a weapon to kill them right then. And you can do that at, ba at basically zero risk to American lives. Getting back to the incentives for using technology before, you can see why then using drones has been extremely attractive from an American policymaker perspective. And also why then people worry that this could lead us to over-rely on this technology. Because it seems so cheap and easy, does that make us more likely to, to, to use these weapons in situations where it's either this or nothing? But important to keep in mind, and I'll get to why I think this is relevant in a second, that our current drones are very limited. They're slow, they can't protect themselves, they're easy to track. One example of this is when a, when a US drone veered too close to the Iranian border a few years ago. A media report suggested that the United States had to scramble uh, F-18s to go basically bail it out. We think of these things as sort of magic, but they're magic because they're flying over Afghanistan and Pakistan, a country with no air defenses and a country letting us be there. Countries that, with real air defenses, could just shoot down our current generation of, uh, of drone technology. But maybe not this. 
This, going back to the, the shot from the, the first slide of my presentation, is the X47B. It's the a next generation a UAV, and this is a shot of it landing on the George H.W. Bush in June 2013. Landing on an aircraft carrier is something so difficult that only the best pilots in the world essentially can do that. That this could be done with an algorithm is nothing short of astounding. But now the question becomes, what are we actually going to do with this technology? And one of the most important debates going on in the American military right now is how to take, how to take this and turn it into a real program that the US military uses over time. And there are two options that are being considered right now. The first is to build something that looks kind of like what I just showed you, kind of like that X-47B, something with a stealthy profile. Note how the, the sort of shape of the wings looks a little bit like a B-2 bomber. That's on purpose, because it makes it easier for it to be uh, stealthy. It's a sort of the high-end option. It's a web, that'd be a weapon system with a, a higher payload. It would have some stealth characteristics. It'd be faster. It would also be really expensive. But it would mean that, for the first time, the United States had uh, a drone that could potentially operate in what are called uh, anti-access area denial environments. Think about it very simply, environments where people are trying to shoot it down. Which is particularly important if you think about some of the challenges we think we might face in East Asia over the next generation. But there's another perspective here. And that's to basically take what we know already works, the Reaper, and build something kind of like that but just have it take off and land from an aircraft carrier. Huge benefit to it, way cheaper. The downside is that it doesn't actually really leverage a whole lot of new uh, technology. It wouldn't be able to survive uh, when people are trying to, to shoot it down. It wouldn't be sort of stealthy at all. It wouldn't even be that much faster. But it'd be optimized for, for sort of the counterterrorism missions the United States has been doing over the last generation. And where this debate goes, I think, is going to be really interesting. It, sh it will show, essentially, getting back to the, you know, one of the questions before about fiscal austerity, how much support will breakthrough technologies have in this new environment of fiscal austerity? Because the temptation, of course, is that in an era of fiscal austerity, to cut way back, to just focus on the proven technologies, not the new stuff. And the point now that I now want to move into is essentially a, an argument for why I think that might be the wrong choice. Why it's important to keep investing in cutting edge technology to ensure that the American warfighters of the next generation have all of the advantages that the American warfighters of the last generation essentially have had. Thinking about this from the perspective of uh, military robotics. And that investments in robotics are accelerating. And they're accelerating. Think back to what I talked about before, about when the differences in the way that innovation spread. And now one of the most important factors is whether there's an underlying commercial incentive for investment in those technologies. Well, robotics is an area where there's massive commercial incentives for investments in those technologies, which I'll talk about in a second. So you have both non-military investments and military investments in these technologies, which leads to a couple of questions. One is even more so, than with something like the Reaper, what would it mean to go to war with a robot army or with a robot air force? Obviously, that's much more science fiction than reality, but you know, just sort of think about that for a second. And then what should the United States do in that kind of environment? And this is important, not just I mean, for the philosophical reason, you know, how people think about warfare, but for a very practical reason, which is that if robotics become the underlying basis or one of the critical underlying bases of military power in the 21st century, that ensuring the United States stays in the lead, stays invested in these areas, will be particularly uh, important. And, but these technologies do raise lots of important questions. The question of what will drive innovation in them, the question of who decides about the use of force, and note the shot of the, I guess it's tough to see from, from this angle, but that's a shot from the Matrix there. I mean, in the movies, obviously, robots are never the good guys. You know, what this will mean for the US, of course, and then is this sort of ethical or legal? Even if you could have a robotic army, for example, would you want to? So what's going to drive innovation in robotics? I think the answer is that it has a lot less to do with militaries than we think. These, this is um, 
a hamburger a building robot. Uh, I just like it because I like hamburgers. It can build up to 365 hamburgers itself uh, in an hour. Uh, on the right here, we have a Toyota invented uh, violin playing robot. Uh, here we have a Roomba, which, uh, which some of you might have, uh, built by uh, iRobot. And then here we have Baxter. Baxter's eyes are really creepy, but uh, Baxter is an industrial robot uh, built to you know, really sort of replace people, uh, um, replace people on the production line and getting increasingly capable. All of these are investments happening regardless of what the United States military does. Which is why I'd like to introduce you to this guy, the Atlas robot, who uh, Defense Secretary Hagel actually met uh, a few days ago at a demonstration at the Pentagon. This is a six foot two, 330 pound robot designed for the purposes of um, essentially humanitarian relief. So you have an earthquake in Haiti, there are people trapped under rubble. What if you could send this robot in to just, you know, to toss away the rubble so first responders can get to the person? Sounds like an awesome use of emerging technology. Now imagine the Atlas robot with some, you know, grenade launchers uh, on the arms. Eh, maybe a little less comfortable, right? And uh, this is uh, called the Big Dog. It's um, a uh, pack-carrying robot that could uh, mar basically march alongside soldiers carrying their equipment for them to lighten the load on them. It's the Cheetah, which can run really fast, and as far as I can tell, has no real other purpose. Uh, they're all uh, built by a company called Boston Dynamics, a company funded by uh, DARPA, funded by the defense industry, but not anymore. Uh, Google purchased them uh, late last year, and in part one of 10 robotics companies that Google's purchased over the last year, and Google essentially said, we will let them fulfill our defense, their defense contracts, but then we have no interest in them really working in this area anymore. Think about how much money we spend on our military every year. If that amount of money, if the potential market is not considered large enough, not considered large enough for Google to want these engineers, the guys who built this stuff and women who built this stuff to focus on that, and instead want them to focus just on commercial robotics, what does that say about the market size for commercial robotics? A market that the United States will not be able to control, and a market that that will then spread uh, around the world, giving lots of countries access to this kind of technology. This is a demonstration of a robotic swarm produced by the GRASP lab, an engineering lab at the University of Pennsylvania. The team can also navigate in environments with obstacles. This is the part, I love this part the most. That's crazy, right? But, so think about what you can do with some of this emerging technology. Now these are just, I've actually, I've been in the lab and seen these. These are sort of like little, little quadcopters about that big. You could potentially make them much bigger or potentially over the next generation much smaller. And now think about the potential military applications of that kind of technology. But that's not funded by the Defense Department. Those are research grants that a lab at the University of Pennsylvania is doing. And this research is on YouTube and published all around the world. Everybody is going to have access to all of this kind of stuff. So then going back to this, the, the MQ-9, the Reaper that I talked about before, and the question I think becomes, the United States is in the lead now, but what will that mean in the future? You know, this is the United States in the lead, that this is the Reaper. This is a strikingly similar looking platform debuted by China at the Paris Air Show in June 2013 called the Wing Lung or the Pterodactyl, which purports to have, although nobody really knows, the, essentially the same capabilities as the Reaper. And now you might think, but yeah, you just showed me that aircraft carrier, that, that, that drone that could take off and land on an aircraft carrier that had that bat wing kind of look. Well, it turns out, China actually tested one just like that, too, called the Sharp Sword in November 2013. And so I think one of the questions moving forward is, there, will the experiments of today, the demos of today, be the warriors of tomorrow? And this, remember I talked about if you put grenade launchers on the Atlas robot? This is a, the Karatas. It's a Japanese robot. Uh, this was actually, this is just a marketing stunt, which obviously worked because I'm still talking about it. Uh, from late 2012, where a Japanese company at a trade expo took uh, one of its largest robots and actually put uh, grenade launchers, a grenade launcher on one arm and a machine gun on the other. Now, they were just firing BBs. They don't have to be just firing BBs, though. And it demonstrates where I think a lot of this technology could be headed and why it's then important 
for the United States to continue investing in it. But don't get me wrong, this technology is going to raise a lot of important questions. And I'll wrap up with, with obviously this sort of frightening example, um, for, and in fact, the way that the light works here that looks even more frightening, uh, from uh, the Terminator. You know, for, for many of us, probably our first exposure to the robots behaving really badly and what that could mean uh, for the, the future of war. Because it raises questions as robotics get more advanced and as you have the potential then for autonomous decision making, not just automatic pilot, it could raise questions about who decides to use force. From an American perspective, of course, we always want there to be a person in what we would call in or on the loop. When our Reapers, for example, launch strikes in, in Afghanistan or, or Pakistan or, or elsewhere, there's a person basically pressing the button and a lawyer and like 25 people behind them. It's a very well orchestrated process. Is there a point at which you would turn that process over to an algorithm? Well, here's one example in public where we do it already. Some of our missile defense systems have what are called automatic modes. Uh, modes where if the number of missiles coming in to an attack an American ship or military base is too many for any individual person to track and individually fire, they have automatic modes that would then let you flip on the system, and then the system would automatically then target and fire individually. And that sounds okay because it's defending American military bases, American soldiers, of course. But what if another country, with maybe different kinds of scruples, wants to invest and use this technology differently? And this, I think, then, is one of the largest questions that the United States faces today. As this sort of technology evolves, what should the United States do? Should the United States be the first mover, figure that someone is going to push the envelope, and so it might as well be us? Should the United States take a more of a wait and see approach? Maybe do research and development, but not deploy this kind of technology, waiting to see if somebody else does it first? Or should the United States try to ban this technology? Try to get together with lots of other countries around the world to ensure that, that things like the Terminator, which, to be clear, science fiction, not gonna happen, is you know, to make sure that things even remotely like that never really happen. And if we could, you know, would that be effective? Those are some of the questions I'm thinking about right now, and I uh, look forward to your questions. Thank you. That's uh, great grist for uh, Twilight Zone. So we'll, tar we'll turn to John Pawkin, Edwardsville School in Illinois. Uh, John Park in Edwardsville. Uh, comment and a question. One thing I find so interesting going back to the GPS and all is how, you know, in science fiction films, we always defeat the aliens because we take out the mothership. And, and so, you know, it seems like you know, as great as this technology is, the potential for being blinded in the battlefield, I would think, would be great. Uh, now, my question is, and you probably have already answered this in a way, uh, I remember after 9-11, uh, there was this idea floated for, like, a commodities exchange trying to anticipate, you know, where the next terrorist attack would happen, and the publicity over that just kind of killed that idea. Um, it almost seems like we need to be going to our a science fiction community and and uh, tapping those brains because of the kind of things that are on the horizon. And the reason I, I'm kind of saying that or asking about, you know, are we doing that is, uh, you know, the novel Dune, which I read a number of years ago, you know, some of the things that, that Frank Herbert, you know, speculated in the 50s when he wrote that are reality today. That's, those are some great... Um... Uh, those are some great points. Could you just repeat the comment one more time? Uh, well, the, the comment about the motherships being taken out like an independent Oh, right. State. So, yeah. the, so the, I think the mothership issue is fascinating because the, it's something the United States is, is very worried about. The United States is extremely dependent on its satellites. How would the United States fight uh, without it? It's one reason why you, you hope that the sorts of training that we're doing for our soldiers you know, includes a world without potentially satellites. It's also why the United States is now trying to invest in actually um, a more robust, either more robust satellites and substitutes for satellites, ways that basically you could have, if you think about um, 
something like BitTorrent and file sharing, essentially peer-to-peer -peer connectivity between uh, different, US, uh, different US nodes on the battlefield. That could then give you the kind of aware, real-time awareness that you get with something like GPS, uh, even if uh, those kinds of, um, even if those kinds of satellites, uh, even if those kinds of satellites uh, go down. And of course, now I forgot what your question was. So, no, just, you... it, it just had to do with oh, getting you know, the sci-fi the getting the sci-fi for... community together. Yeah. Uh, so, two points on that. One, uh, I have no idea if we do, but I would like to be there if we do, because I think that that would be really uh, interesting. But a footnote on that commodities market. So it's true that we eliminated that commodities market because it turned out having people spend real money to bet on the probability of a terrorist attack, that may not have been politically uh, a great idea. However, uh, a pro actually an academic project I work on, uh, funded by the government, uh, is a, a next generation um, sort of safer version of that called uh, the ACE program funded by the Intelligence Advanced uh, Research Projects Agency. Is the, the idea is actually to use methods like prediction markets and the wisdom of crowds and uh, algorithms to forecast international political events, but not in a like commodities market where people can win and lose real money kind of way. So there's actually still interest in using those methodologies. There's just uh, being applied in a slightly different fashion now. A question from our guest, Ashley Shepard from Boeing. Hello. Um, I guess my question is, you know, especially seeing what Google's doing in the robotics field and how they've taken a very hard stance about not wanting to be involved in defense, do you foresee the U.S. government changing their acquisition policy to entice someone like Google to do business with them, or how do you see them trying to tap in to the innovation of a technology that's so commercially focused? That is a great question. Uh, but before I answer that question, Boeing did one of the coolest things that could offer the first things for the future for uh, unmanned aerial vehicles and military robotics uh, last summer. Uh, Boeing demonstrated uh, some advances in their ability to remotely pilot uh, F-18s, which raises the potential for essentially man-machine teams up in the air where you have something like an F-35 or F-22 surrounded by uh, a fourth generation aircraft, like some F-14s, F-15s, you know, F-18s, you know, whatever sort of working together. It's incredibly cool uh, work that uh, Boeing is doing on that. Uh, I think that, I mean, I will, I will add my vo voice to the chorus of everybody who thinks that our acquisition system uh, clearly needs uh, reform. But it obviously seems like a problem if, if, the, if investments in military, if getting, if the incentives to invest in military technology are, are, are not high enough, so the best and the brightest stuff is, is not even being considered as part of the equation, that's obviously a, a problem, and it's especially a problem because we think, you know, it's not just robotics. You know, we could have talked about uh, three-dimensional printing. We could have talked about, you know, lots of different new technology areas where the underlying driver is going to be business and commercial oriented. And so I, I, I am not optimistic about our ability to have significant acquisition reform, except that I think since the United States always does the right thing after trying everything else, uh, I think that uh, this will probably be an example of that, where as, in, in that if, commercial technology started to genuinely outpace what we had, I think we would, one of, the, one of the great things about our system is we can actually recover. Okay, Bruce DeMacio, Tosin University in Maryland. Hi, thank you for taking my question. When you're talking about who decides force, and you framed it in the idea of fiscal austerity as an era we're in at the moment, all eras pass. Times change, political parties change their philosophies, their ideas. On that idea, where do you see us in the next five years to 10 years? Are we still planning that far ahead, even though our hands are tied to some degree in the moment? And do you see that moment sustaining itself at its peak or ebbing? Well, no one can change the Pentagon's planning process, and the Pentagon plans in five-year increments. So we will continue to plan, and you know, the Pentagon will probably continue to plan in, in, in five-year increments. If you, you know, if you, if one wanted to be really, really dorky about it and look at sort of the green book that's, you know, blessfully now online and searchable, that the, the Pentagon publishes every year, sort of with the defense budget. It's essentially it's a five-year, it's essentially a five-year forecast. It's actually one of the biggest problems that at least I saw when I was uh, working in the Department of Defense, which was that the lack of certainty due to sequestration and the question of whether or not sequestration will last for 10 years or not significant, has significantly hindered effective long-term planning. I mean, think about it, you know, if you don't know what your budget is, how can you plan? 
And so what you end up with is multiple plans for multiple sort of budget targets, which kind of wastes everybody's time. Uh, I'm not incredibly optimistic about the, a, a, a large scale sequestration resolution for the Defense Department uh, over the next few years, in part because I think that both parties have incentives to not make, you know, going back to what Ron said about sort of adults having uh, conversations that involve choices, both sides I think have electoral incentives to not make those kinds of hard choices. And because since, you know, you, uh, you, it's always easier to deal with the thing right in front of you than the thing far away. And the effect of sequestration on the American military, I think is like a slow rolling snowball that becomes an avalanche. But it won't become an avalanche until maybe the, the you know, two presidential terms down the line. And so I don't think there's a, a, a strong incentive to, to actually you know, finally fix it right now, which I think is unfortunate. We have a question at the end of this row of tables. I can't see the card. If you can identify yourself. Yes, Patrick Tuart, again from Virginia. Um, we have Fort AP Hill there in Virginia, and of course Fort Meade up in Maryland. And we, in the post 9 11 world where you know, 19 hijackers with box cutters can you know, com commit a terrible atrocity, but also strike terribly at the American heartland. Uh, and I, I understand your point about deterrence, and certainly uh, there's a historic precedent for that. But when you think about the history of asymmetrical warfare, it seems to me that we have to make choices and in terms of IEDs and threats like that. What role do you see in, in terms of technology versus actually how to deal with an enemy that's, that does not have this technology and will never have this technology yet is, is clearly the, the, the threat currently against the, the U.S. Uh, security? Thanks. I think that's a great question and I think it highlights one of the weaknesses actually in our focus on technology in that the, to the extent that we, you know, we are, for all the reasons I laid out, focus on developing military technological solutions to many problems, then what it can lead to is essentially a, a really expensive to solutions to, to what are very cheap things that adversaries do, which is one of the things you've seen in, in responding to IEDs, uh, for example. IEDs are extremely cheap for adversaries to build. Our solutions to IEDs if you think about things like MRAPs, you think about other sorts of technological solutions we employ are basically always more expensive, which put us on the wrong side of the cost curve. But, the, but I'd say, but, but pulling back a little bit, I mean, I, I'd say, and in in actually I think I, I wrote something like this in, um, in a publication for, for FPRI a, a few years ago, that the, in, in some ways, almost logically, the wars you prepare for the most are, are the ones you're the least likely to fight. And if we spent most of our defense dollars focused on the, you know, some of those low-end challenges, it, we, we, we could, you know, maybe, maybe I, and I believe in American ingenuity and our ability to solve problems. I think that we would be, we could, we'd be very successful at that, but it might then make some of those higher-end challenges, which are now less likely because we've convinced everyone else to stay out of the market, basically. It could, it could make some of those sort of more likely, and so I think this, these are tough choices. What we've tried to do over the last several years is balance between those things. To, to both focus on what's necessary for today's wars and sort of look ahead for the next generation. And I think part of what the United States military is trying to do, especially as it figures out what the, the presence in Afghanistan will look like over time, is how those things should be balanced over the next uh, decade, especially in the context of a rising China. And we have another question on this row of tables here. Identify yourself. Yes, sir. John Underwood, Paulding County High School. Um, I'll start out with an apology, I guess. I'm not sure if it's a really a question or, or an observation here. I know 30-some years ago there was, a, there was an ethical question posed um, to, to people in my line of work uh, about, you know, if, if you're so far behind, say, the forward line of troops and you're supposed to destroy a bridge at a certain amount of, at a certain time, and five minutes before that, a, a group of school kids walk onto that bridge and stand there. What do you do when that time happens? You know, putting the, the, uh, the human element back into it. Okay, well, there's nothing going on. I can let them pass versus, no, this bridge needs to be destroyed at a certain time. And, and technology, it, there is that question right now is, is where do we stop? You know, where does it end along with that? that, is, that is there an algorithm that can make those conscious decisions about what you can and can't do or should and, and not do. 
you know. I think that's a, I think that's a great point, and I actually think this is a, a good place to say that. I think despite some of the hype surrounding things like, like the singularity and, and some of the, the things you can kind of Google up about artificial intelligence, I think a lot of that uh, stuff is, a, you, how quickly people think we're going to get to that point can be a little bit overstated, and that the, the complexity of calculations needed to make that kind of judgment is so complicated and difficult that you, you, you wonder if a machine could ever get there. You know, if it could, there's actually a group called the, the Band, there's a group called the Band Killer Robots Campaign, which are the same people that sponsored the landmines ban and the cluster munitions ban, who want to ban sort of that kind of autonomous decision making uh, before it ever really uh, happens. Now, now, whether that could be effective or not uh, aside, because you're talking about trying to ban software, essentially. The, one of the interesting questions is, suppose that technology was, was really good. Suppose it was really good. We know that you know, the 18-year-old kids who we you know, entrust with, with live munitions do an amazing job nearly all of the time, but that sometimes they, you know, they misjudge you know, who the bad guy versus you know, like little Susie on the battlefield. Are we sure a machine would be worse at that? I mean, I think probably a machine would be worse at that, uh, but that's because I doubt that the technology could ever get there. Uh, if that, and, and that's why I think the United States will Will, will be very, very limited, very, very cautious, especially uh, in its use of on the ground autonomous you know, weapons. The United States is not, currently is not currently developing or deploying any autonomous weapon systems. But no, it's a great question. Uh, Gary Morris from uh, Kentucky. Thank you for taking the question. I have actually two. Uh, the first one, goes toward a, a sort of a larger question that you've talked about, but I, I would like a little focus on. As we go more and more towards technological types of warfare, do we get to a point where we so dehumanize warfare that it now becomes easier to declare war? Um, because at that point, you have a person watching from far away, and we just blow somebody away, and there's, there's no thought of the consequences of that particular act. The other question I have is, is at some point, obviously people can hack technology. My concern then becomes, when are people in opposing countries to us now developing ways to hack into our technology and be able to use it against us? Um, those, are two, those are two fantastic questions. So the, the first one on will, does the development of these technologies decrease the threshold for, for war? I, I think there's certainly the possibility for, for something like that. In terms of the human cost of it, there's some interesting research that just come out showing that uh, drone pilots actually experience uh, PTSD at similar rates to uh, manned pilots, which is, which is terrible. Obviously, you don't want anybody to have PTSD. But from the perspective of thinking about what, what remote warfare means for how, we, how people internalize warfare, that actually suggests that, that, that war by remote control doesn't completely eliminate what that experience is like. Now, but that's just for the individuals pressing the button or, or flying it. I think there certainly is the potential for the more abstract something becomes you know, the easier it is to push, uh, to push a button. And while, for example, our you know, UAVs are uh, basically always going to be more accurate than any other means of using force, if the choice is a UAV or something else, essentially any strike where the choice is a UAV or nothing, any, sorts of, any sort of collateral damage or something is an additive. It's in damage, or that's a strike that wouldn't have happened kind of otherwise. And so I do think this is going to raise really uh, complicated and kind of interesting questions. The hacking issue, I think when you if, you, if you talk to people, say, in the air, like pilots in the Air Force, uh, in the Navy, who would be very skeptical about the future of military robotics, uh, the, one of the first, you know, within, you know, a minute of the conversation starting, you know, uh, hacking is something that they'll bring up, and I think for good, uh, good reason. Uh, there were reports last week, for example, that the U.S. may have been flying a, a drone around uh, some part of Ukraine, and that the Russians might have hacked it. The, there, was, uh, there were reports that in Afghanistan and Iraq that sort of smaller U.S. Uh, drones, like Ravens and Shadows, 
sort of admin hacked? I mean, it's one of the things that if, if we all needed, you know, any, like, not that we need another reminder of the importance of information security, but if you, the more you rely on remote control war, the more information security matters. And this is especially shows, you know, what I was talking about before when I talked about stealth and how, in some ways, its potential has only been demonstrated against less capable adversaries. It's, it's another case in thinking about the information security of some of our remote platforms. They've only really been, it's only really been demonstrated against less capable adversaries. And my suspicion would be, I have, I have no basis to know this, my suspicion would be that we're gonna need to amp that up a bit before we, we, we would wanna be comfortable relying more on these kinds of capabilities. Okay, Bruce DeMacio. When, he, when Gary asked that question, the thought that popped in my mind was the idea of the failure of the system itself. Uh, the, the movie Failsafe popped into my mind, where nuclear war occurs because a transistor blew. So when I'm looking at your notes, the more we get more technologically superior, to me it also means the curve exists, there's a greater chance for fallibility. Can you address that? Because it then seems to see we have to have people in the loop. Oh, absolutely. I think there's a potential for fallibility, and I think you could, two different ways to maybe approach this. One is think about legal liability. So if, imagine that you had an autonomous weapon system that shoots an innocent civilian. So now who is liable for that? From a law of war perspective, it's a, if it's a person shooting somebody, like that's, that's actually reasonably clear. But, well now it depends on the programming. Did it shoot the civilian because of a software flaw? So is it the software engineer that programmed it that's really to blame? It, did it shoot somebody because of the rules of engagement? which would mean the person who set the rules of engagement, a sort of maybe senior military commander, that that person would be to blame? Did it shoot the civilian because it uh, didn't, did it shoot the civilian just because of a, 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 some sort of mistake, in which case maybe the person that flipped it on that day is to blame? They're really difficult questions. I think they're resolvable questions, but, they're, but there's a whole additional set of questions that'll need to be answered from, uh, I think certainly from a legal perspective. From a fallibility perspective, the uh, you know pure fallibility perspective, I mean this will it will depend how much we trust our technology, and I think one of the 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 risks and to get on a, a, a five second soapbox about the you know sort of decline of American math and science education, and especially the decline of American born uh, PhD students in uh, sciences and in engineering. One of the, the challenges could be is as technology advances but increasingly approaches magic for the, which I, which I didn't make up, which is a, is a quote from somebody I just don't remember who right now, then it, it raises questions about, well, how, would we, how will we even figure out when it's likely to misfire, when there's likely to be, uh, when, it's, when it's likely to be a, a problem? I mean, the, so in some ways the solution to that is a more technically educated population that better understands how all of this stuff works and so can head off some of these issues. But there's absolutely gonna be, I think, a fallibility issue with, uh, with robotics. And we're gonna have to accept, you know, what we, what's easy to say for, for robotics, we have to accept a failure rate, just like you accept a failure rate for, for lots of sorts of technologies that you build or buy. The question will be, is that failure rate higher than when we don't use that technology? Because, you know, troops on the ground, people piloting planes, people driving ships, I mean, they make mistakes too. The question's gonna be what the error rate is compared to the error rate without these systems. We have a question on this side. I can't see the name. Suzanne Wooten, uh, Sandra Day O'Connor High School in Phoenix. I'm looking at the economic side of it because realistically Congress decides appropriations and Congress people are dependent upon the economic you know, security of their states. At what point is, the, is there a tipping point with, with the cost of innovations and inventions? It used to be that military spending brought a lot of jobs to a state. And now, I mean, we're increasing military spending dramatically, but they're not seeing that economic benefit to their state. So is there a cost where it's gonna save soldiers' lives, but it's only gonna bring three or four jobs rather than 10,000 jobs? That's a really good question, and, and in some ways, our friend from Boeing might be best positioned to, uh, to, to answer it rather than me. But, but, uh, but, but I, think the, I, I think it actually, right now, 
military robotics, I think, has looked like a sideshow to most of America's big defense contractors. In that, and there's been a little bit of a concern when someone like me like gives a talk uh, uh, like this for more of a defense, a defense contractor audience, one of the concerns is, well, we, we want to be building our like 2,000 F-35s, we want to be building aircraft carriers, those things bring lots of jobs. Aren't all the, these robotic solutions, this seems like fewer jobs. Uh, I think that's probably not the case, actually. I think we're talking about building different stuff rather than less stuff. And that I think one of the, you know, to go back to the acquisition reform question, I think one of the things that potentially goes hand in hand with some of this is building, building on a faster cycle up in updating your technology more often. Right now we build really small numbers of really expensive stuff with the idea being that no one's ever going to be able to, we want to make our stuff perfect so that all of our people are safe and so that our stuff is, you know, always, you know, is, is the best uh, in the world. That works really well for building naval ships, for example, in a world where you think the probability that a US ship gets sunk by somebody else is basically zero. But in a world of, say, proliferated global robotics, where lots and lots of countries have access to this kind of technology, then building small numbers of really expensive platforms may not actually be the right way to go. What you might want to do instead is build larger numbers of more expendable platforms that, you, that are cheaper, that you refresh more often. But that's going to bring plenty of business to, you know, to Boeing, to Lockheed, to Raytheon, to all the defense contractors. They're still going to get to build lots of stuff. It's just going to build different stuff. The thing that will displace the jobs is the commercial robots. It's not, uh, it's not, the, it's not whether the military is. It's, it's, it's Baxter, the industrial robot with the creepy eyes. That's, that's the thing that I think is, is, the, is the, 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 the job issue. It's less the, the military's investment in robotics. Curtis White from Arkansas. You hit on one thing that I'm concerned about very quickly in the, in the PowerPoint, and that is how a lot of these inventions and innovations are quickly copied by those that we're not associated with, like China. And that's what I'm concerned with, because it seems like every new gadget that comes up, we can't control others from duplicating it. And the, the effect of that on our defense system is going to be amazing. I think that is absolutely true. I mean, I think it's one of, one of the, in, in my, you know, if I had to you know, list my you know, top couple of concerns about the future, for the future of the U.S. military, that is one of them. And that I think that, you know, going back to those diffusion curves that I was showing before, I think the diffusion of new technology, especially things like robotics that are being pushed by commercial industry, but, but also other sorts of things like GPS as well, is happening really quickly. It's not something that we're going to be able to keep a lid on. It's not something that we've been able to keep a lid on, on so far. And then as this technology spreads around the world, it's another reason for, in some ways, that, that different kind of model of building stuff that I was just talking about, that we can't rely on developing a widget and having nobody else get close to that widget for 20 years, which is basically how we've operated for the last couple of generations. We're going to need to be able to re react faster because a lot of this technology, a lot of this information age technology is and will, I think, spread very quickly. I think that last question was made for Mike Horowitz. He is the author of a book on the diffusion of military power, and that's exactly what that question was uh, getting at. Um, thank you, uh, Mike Horowitz, for uh, re wonderful remarks on uh, a topic that I'm sure uh, students in particular would be deeply interested in. And um, I would note only that both Mike and uh, Ron's uh, talks, there was a kind of a sub-theme running through it, which is the apparent inability or unwillingness of leaders in both political parties to deal with key issues of uh, deciding how to allocate resources, what the responsibilities of uh, superpower are. Uh, but I hope uh, in conferences like these, we'll uh, increase our ability to make those kinds of decisions.